Hello. Uh, again, welcoming you all in Global Investigative Journalism Conference and to our panel, FOIA RTI Investigations. I'm Mira Chowdhury, Bangla editor at GIGN, and filling the large shoe of Toby McIntosh, who was supposed to host this. But uh, he couldn't join, so I'll be moderating uh, and talking less. Uh, but to talk here, we have a very ex esteemed panel, uh, diversely experienced on FOIA and RTI issues. Uh, because uh, this panel uh, is so relevant for us because now public documents have become a very significant, if not the most important tool in investigative reporting. Uh, but in also uh, data journalism in terms of data gathering and other resources. So new tools are emerging, new technologies are uh, emerging, and new strategies are being implemented. But often, uh, like half of the countries in the world have this kind of laws, allowing public officials uh, to share the documents upon request. But it is also true that in many jurisdictions, accessing records to FOIA or RTI can be uh, very painstaking, very time consuming, uh, and, and there are other challenges as well because in some countries there are issues of record availability, there are formats, and there are a lot of other issues that is related to accessing these records. So uh, without talking much, let me introduce to you to our panel, uh, as you can already see in the board, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this table. So Myung Ju Lee uh, is from Korea, and she's an investigative reporter from KCIJ News Tapa, and she managed and uh, participated in several cross-border investigative reporting projects, including very high-profile projects like uh, FinCEN Files and others. And, and she will demonstrate uh, the importance of co cooperation and collaboration as well uh, in, in terms of uh, accessing records and also uh, using them. We have Luis Fernando Toledo, uh, director of Abraji, and is a driving force behind organizations like Ficam Sabendo and datafixers.org, if I'm not wrong, Luis, yeah. Uh, and which uh, these organizations specialize in data and public records to support investigative journalism. His work has exposed wrongdoing in public sphere and saved millions in, of public funds in Brazil. Uh, we have Matt Samnell, a journalist from Sweden. Uh, he not only brings extensive experience as a reporter, but also offers a public information helpline in Sweden. Uh, and a and, and lot of people, uh, when they are struggle to get access to public records, they approach Matt, and Matt helps them in many ways. Yeah? So he has been doing it for a long time, and one of the most experienced person in a country which has one of the long-standing uh, public record access laws, yeah? if not the oldest. So and finally, uh, we have none but uh, Amanda Hickman, the Chief Operating Officer of MuckRock Foundation in the United States. MuckRock is in many ways very unique and uh, it provides the ecosystem so that journalists not only can access but also can seek their support to access data. And they also have databases uh, like uh, in many ways uh, they facilitate and report on public records, uh, if I'm not wrong, Amanda. Yeah. So this is our esteemed panel. Uh, without further ado, I would like to start uh, delve into the discussion. Yeah, I would like to start with Minjo, if you can please. Yeah, sure. Yes, your presentation is coming. Y you can also prefer to be there if you all want. Okay, thank you, yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Myung Ju Lee and I'm from Korea, I have, I'm a reporter at the Korea Center for Investigative Journalism. So I'm really excited to talk about FOIA in Korea and how we use FOIA to expose the public prosecutor's secretive budget spending. This is our very new and still ongoing project, so it's a very hot issue in Korea right now. So, but before we talk about it, just let me briefly introduce you about FOIA, how FOIA works in Korea. So we call it Official Information Disclosure Act, and made, it was made into law in 1996 and implemented in 1998. And I was surprised that it was actually, Korea was actually, South Korea was actually the first country in Asia to adopt 
to have this uh, four-year policy. And it applies basically to all public institutions from presidential office to parliament and prov uh, provincial and municipal government and education institutions, state-run corporations, and even social welfare corporations and nonprofits that receive government funding. So who can file for your request? All Korean citizens, of course, corporations and organizations, but you'll be interested in foreigners, right? Um, you're only possible to request FOIA only when you have a registered address in Korea, inside Korea. And if you're st staying in Korea temporarily for your academic or research purposes, and um, if you're a foreign corporation or organization that has an office in Korea, so that's it. But if you are not, if you don't belong to the, like, the above three, no, you cannot, unfortunately, but yeah. Luckily, you have us, KCIJ, as your partner, Global Team. I'm part of Global Team, KCIJ, so we'll be there for you. We've done a lot of collaborations, cross-border collaborations, and we've done a lot of FOIA for you. So if you need any like assistance that with like, requesting FOIA in Korea, just reach out to us. So how to file a FOIA request? It's really simple because we have this awesome website and called like information disclosure site and it's www.open.go.kr and when you when you like your situation applies to like all these like, and you can apply I, I mean file for FOIA you just log in and then you fill in these parts and then it only takes 10 business days which is pretty fast I guess for them to <laughs> process and notify their decision and the decision will be either full release of information partial no release at all, or they could just say, oh, the re information you request does not exist. And they actually, the information, they have eight reasons not to disclose, like um, refuse to release any information, because mainly because it's um, for privacy concerns, or it could violate national security concerns. So they, those are the main reasons. Um, but yeah, that's not the end. You can raise objection or file administrative appeal, appeal or you can actually go and do administrative litigation, which is file a motion to release the information you are seeking. So that's how actually KCIJ obtained the information on the prosecution pr budget. So let me talk about this. So it goes back a little while. So in October 20. 2019, FOIA, we filed FOIA to the Supreme Prosecutor's Office in the Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office, and we asked for three specific types of spending, which usually they spend in the most obscure way, which is special, act special activity expense, um, which is allocated to use to be used for investigation or intelligence activities that require secrecy. So that. Huge, yeah, that's like hidden in the shadow forever. So we requested it, and their decision was no disclosure. They said no such information exists. But that is not the end of our story. That was just the beginning of our new journey. So what we did, we just took it to the court. So that's our lesson one. Even if your FOIA request is denied, do not give up. Pursue <laughs> it even if it means taking it to the court. So in November 19, we filed a motion against prosecution decision. And in January, it, it took a long time, like a long fight at the court. And January last year, the prosecution's claim of like, the information not existing was not accepted at the lower court. but. Yeah, they fought back and filed an appeal. But at the appeals court as well, they were ordered to release most of the information that we requested. But they took it to the Supreme Court anyway. But finally, April this year, Supreme Court appealed the appeals court decision and they were ordered to release this information. So that's what happens. On June 23rd this year, Finally, after three years and seven months, there's a milestone moment. That's not prosecution, like prosecutors, that's our reporters, KCIJ, reporters taking stuff, materials from prosecution office. So 
we are very proud. <laughs> like I was, wow, you guys look like Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> so, but <laughs> it's not happy ending. So lesson two, you may receive heavily redacted document, but don't be discouraged because see, like our reporters just worked day and night to just gather clues because we received 16,000 pages of photocopies, receipts, and payment details, but so much information has been scratched off or just deleted, so we had to just work on to put the puzzle pieces together. So what kind of pieces? We looked, we searched Prosecutor General's daily schedule, which is posted on the prosecution website, and um, we also searched for investigation list and information from the prosecution annual report and some civ uh, another like information was their luncheon and dinner meetings shown on the, their spending details. So with all these spend details and pieces of information, the reporters were able to create the mapping of 48 restaurants that um, Yoon sa he um, used to frequent. He is our president now, but he used to be prosecutor. So yeah, there was a fun, really fun part. and also created a really awesome interactive page. So there's a date, and when you select a date, it shows, so it's in Korean, but yeah, the m amount of money that was spent, and then who spent it, like what kind of major events took, uh, took place on that date. So yeah, there's also lesson three. Lesson two was pretty yeah, good, so then we yeah, encourage you to actively collaborate with experts and specialized civic groups. In our case, we worked with three civic groups in this project. And lesson four, partner with the local nonprofit investigative newsrooms to expand the scope of your investigative investigation. So after like this strenuous work we've done, We now expanded our investigation into 65 regional prosecutor's offices, which is everywhere. So we've had to form a joint investigative team, which was just formed in July 23. And there we go, on September 14th, there was a season two of this uh, opening of the safe of the prosecution. So yeah, we were really excited about this. And what happened on the September 14th, do you know? This happened. Yeah, but we are still working on our season two. Yeah, it's ongoing. We didn't give up. We are still fighting. And yeah, we just do journalism as we have done. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. So many thanks, Minju. So I think it takes us like to to a couple of valid questions. One is like uh, you have to be ingenuine, you have to be persistent, uh, you have to be innovative, but also sometimes there could be risk associated with it uh, in many countries where sensitive information, uh, because you are applying by exposing your name and details in some cases. So I, I will I will go back to these questions, but I would like to go to now Louise uh, and and. Also, Louise, I'm sure you have not only used public records widely, but also uh, processed and analyzed them in a way uh, so that it could produce certain level of data. Yeah, yeah, you. you. Here, yeah. Ah, no problem. Ah, you can use. It. Thank you. So I think the, our story is very, very similar. We don't have that awesome picture of, pic of people taking the documents, but we have a picture of documents. <laughs> so radical sharing. Uh, what I'm going to tell is that these organizations, Fik and Sabendo and Data Fixers, we like to share everything that we got, get from FOIA requests. And we believe this is the best way to work with public transparency because FOIA is a human right, but uh, access to public records is a human right. So we are always uh, sharing the documents we receive. The context, uh, Brazil's Freedom of Information Act was enacted in uh, 2012. 
So it's very recent, uh, but there is advantage in there because uh, the fact that it was enacted recently makes everything easier in certain cases. Uh, you have a lot of documents in a digital format, not in this case that I'm going to present, but in general, it, it's good. Like the federal government uh, shares many stuff uh, online. So it, because it was enacted in 2012, it's a little bit easier than in other countries. Uh, one good thing is that every request sent to the federal government by any person is made available online. So there's a database of FOIA requests in Brazil. So if you want to see what other people have asked, if you want to have like an idea, if you want to find a data set, it's like a Google of FOIA. So you can find many things in this database. And it's a good thing because transparency is advances when you send a new request, everybody gets something from that. Uh, and if the government accepts to send an information to an individual, they cannot deny the same data to another person. So sharing knowledge is the best way to avoid state secrecy. Uh, these are the two projects that uh, I work now with data fixers. I worked for five years with Fiquem Sabendo. Uh, and these are some of the projects that we have. So don't lie to me, lie is the acronym for Lei de Acesso à Informação or Access to Information Law. This is a newsletter. We have 16,000 subscribers. Most are journalists, researchers, and it's released every 15 days with new data that people can use in their stories. We have a Wikilite, it's a Wikipedia page with tutorials about how you can use FOI. It's very based on the FOIA week in the US, it's very similar. Uh, we have Linus Redações, which is a, a, a series of workshops about how people can use public data, not only for journalism pro purposes, but also research and other stuff. Uh, and Agenda Transparente is a new project where you can find government schedules in a single platform. It's much easier to navigate. Uh, if you want to contact Fiquem Sabendo, this is their email. Uh, so this is Data Fixers. If you want to look up our website, you can just take a picture of that QR code. Uh, it's a project supported by the Brown Institute for Media Innovation at Columbia University. And the idea here is to find uh, public records and use them to investigate environmental crimes, not only in Brazil, but in all countries related to Amazon, to the Amazon region. Uh, so now I'm going to tell the specific story that is that there are some similarities uh, with the previous story. Uh, so we released the presidential corporate card expenses for the first time. Uh, former President Brazilian Bolsonaro, he loves to party and there are many pictures of him like uh, in motorcycles and having party with other people, but the problem is that they, he used public funds to do that. And sometimes he should be working, but he's not. So uh, we, we had to learn a new word in Brazil, motociata. I'm not sure if there's an English word for that, it's like a motorcade. Uh, so we had to learn that, that new word, Bolsonaro was always doing that, those motociatas and spending a lot of public funds with the corporate card. But people didn't know until the last day of his mandate how much money was spent, how they spent that money. So that was the question uh, that, we, 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 that started this project. So we sent several FOIA requests. It was denied in the beginning. There was a fight in the court, like very similar stuff. And then uh, after a year, we got more than 10,000 receipts. But the problem is that they were uh, th there were no digital copies. So we asked them to go there in person, we bought a scanner, and we spent like a few months scanning all those documents. This is Alexandre, this is a, a guy who helped us, and we have a team, like three people doing that all day. Uh, and in the end, we got things like this. It's not really easy to, to analyze this kind of data, but we use some platforms. So this is Nutella. <laughs> That's something that Bolsonaro loves. <laughs> so we used these two platforms. First, we were using Google Pinpoint, and then we received a grant from Muckrock, and now we are using Document Cloud. It's much, much easier to navigate. You can search Nutella or any other word, and it's much, much easier to find the documents that you need and uh, for reporters and to share with other reporters, etc. So one of the things that we found in that project is that Bolsonaro poses himself as a humble person. He's always taking pictures like this uh, when, when he uh, is eating something. Uh, there was like a, a, a government official announcement where you can see condensed milk there. So he's always trying like to say that he he doesn't spend money, but in the end we found like several expensive barbecues and uh, and wine and things like that. So uh, very different image that the one he was showing when he was a president. So we released the data uh, of those uh, corporate card receipts in a newsletter. 
uh, the Don't Lie to Me newsletter, uh, because we wanted everyone to look at it. Uh, we realized that alone we wouldn't be able to analyze 10,000 documents. Uh, and you need people with different backgrounds, people with different sources. So we, we found out that the best way was just sharing the data instead of doing reporting ourselves. So we partnered with several organizations. And in the end, the, the impact was huge, because uh, we would be able to produce maybe two or three stories, but the media in Brazil, not only in Brazil, but in other countries, they produce more than a thousand stories about the corporate card expenses. Uh, this is the one from The Guardian, but we have several stories in Brazilian media outlets, other countries. So, And people, they could write the story they wanted. If they want to write a story about curiosities, like uh, spending money with ice cream, they could. If they want to find out something about corruption, they can. So uh, anybody can do, uh, it, it's free. Uh, and if you think that people won't give you credit because you just share the data, uh, in this case, we found that media was really nice with us. So CNN mentioned it, and they mentioned our work like for two minutes. I just want to present this video where they are giving us credit for the work. Sabendo, fiquem sabendo, é uma espécie de organização comandada por um jornalista, o Fernando Toledo, que chegou a trabalhar aqui com a gente, nosso time de dados da CNN. Ele está há muitos anos trabalhando com lei de acesso à informação e foi por conta dele por um pedido de lei de acesso à informação que ele fez há bastante tempo e que foi atendido. Ele teve acesso às notas fiscais que estão dentro do processo de prestação de contas do cartão corporativo do Palácio do Planalto. Na semana passada, o governo havia liberado acesso aos gastos de cada presidente, mas por conta das notas que foram enviadas ao Tribunal de Contas da União para a prestação de contas, Agora, graças ao Fiquem Sabendo, essa organização para disseminação e combate à desinformação, disseminação do bom jornalismo e combate à desinformação, é que a gente conseguiu saber exatamente com que o presidente Jair Bolsonaro gastou dinheiro. So uh, I wanted to share this just to show that like even CNN highlighted the work that Fiquem Sabendo did. So when you are nice to people, sometimes they will be nice to you. Uh, and these are the lessons learned. So F FOI is really, really powerful, not only in Brazil, but uh, the government tried to deny the data and we got it anyway. Uh, public records need to be public. So uh, journalists like to withhold information. I understand this is part of the game, but sometimes it's important to share because people will have other insights that you didn't have. If you can't share like with everyone, at least share with your colleagues in your newsroom or find a way to, to let, let other people see what you have. Uh, access to information is a human right, it's not a favor, so use it and insist when records are not delivered. And when you have several documents, it's much easier to have more people with different backgrounds work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. Uh, I think let's move to Europe. Mats. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, can you show my presentation, please? Oh, thank you. Uh, I will talk a little about uh, uh, the right to information, RTI, and how it's used by Swedish journalists. Uh, and I will also tell you a little about the, the help desk I'm running. Uh, this is where it's all based. It's the Act of Freedom of Press from 1766. It's said to be the oldest one in, Sweden, in, in the world. Uh, I don't think it's the best yet, but quite good still. Uh, this is how it works. Uh, and uh, when I hear about from my colleagues in Brazil and Korea, I feel very privileged, as you can see when I tell uh, how I use this right myself. Uh, anyone can take part of these documents or photos, maps, or whatever kind of information, stuff that is kept within an authority or in Public, most publicly owned companies. Uh, it's free of charge, almost. They, sometimes there could be a small fee. Uh, you don't have to be a Swedish citizen. There is no age limits, no limits for the number of uh, documents or requests you made. Uh, and the rule is that this should be handled very quickly, uh, immediately, or within one or two days. Uh, there are some of examples of public information. There you could get very extensive information about individuals and companies, organizations. Uh, most documents within authorities and courts 
registers and databases, archives. Uh, a number of exceptions, national security, of course, military information, uh, relations with other states or international organizations, uh, police matters, public investigations, uh, and of course, uh, information about that could be uh, personal integrity or private information about persons, companies, and organizations. Um, and this is a little bit about how I use it as a journalist. I work very locally. Uh, I'm a reporter in uh, a small town in south of Sweden, so I report mostly from one place. Uh, the first thing to the left, you can see uh, it's a list from the local municipality. They send it every morning to me, and it's a list of incoming, outgoing, and uh, produced documents within this authority. Uh, I read the list, and I send an email back and ask for the documents I'm interested in. Uh, and I send it often the same day or with one day's delay, maybe, or so. The other one is the, a list from the local police, uh, just telling uh, the crimes reported the last 24 hours. Uh, and uh, then I can call the local police and ask a little bit more about it, what has happened and so on. Uh, so this is uh, a great sources for everyday reporting about things that happen, political decisions and uh, things that will happen in the future and so on. Uh, and there are some examples uh, of articles I've made. Uh, there's so, so little time now, so I can't go into in detail, but it's examples both of investigative reporting and, uh, and everyday reporting uh, of things that has happened. Uh, this is another example of how this is used. It's a database uh, built up by Swedish journalists, and they have uh, gathered thousands and thousands of public documents from uh, courts. Uh, and uh, if you have access, only journalists can get access to this. Uh, you can search on names or companies and so on. Uh, and uh, as you see here, I've searched on my own name, and you find a, lo a lot of documents here uh, from court. It doesn't mean that I'm a criminal, <laughs> but it means that I have taken a number of cases to court in uh, RTI cases. So that's why my name appeared there. But this is great when you try to investigate criminals or suspected persons or companies or so on. Well, how does well does this work? I what I told you now is how the law is written. Uh, but is it different if you when it is implemented? I made a test. Uh, I sent uh, emails requests to 150 local authorities in Sweden. There are 290 of these, so a little bit more than half. Uh, and, and I asked for the employment contract for the uh, municipality director, the big boss in the municipality. And the reason for this is that I, I knew this would be definitely be a public document, but it could also feel a little bit controversial for the authority to give it out. Uh, and I also wanted to see if you are treated differently by the authority, depending on who you are. So I. In, 50 cases I pretended uh, to be a student, and uh, in 50 cases I introduced myself as a citizen, and the rest of the 50 uh, I introduced myself as the journalist Matt Samnell. And the qu questions I wanted to an get answered from, will they give me the documents, how long will it take, and do you get equal treatment depending on who you are? So this is the result. Um, after three work days, uh, the journalist was a little bit ahead of the others. Uh, ten work days, uh, a little bit better for the other ones. And after <coughs> 20 work days, uh, there were only five of the local municipalities 
that had not answered and given out. So 145 gave out the documents. Uh, some of them were a little bit late. It was a little bit harder for, for the student and the citizen, but I still think this works quite well. No one refused to, to give out. The five uh, who, they, uh, who didn't answer, they, there was no reaction. Uh, I think it was more like bad handling than a real, a real uh, refusal, so, so to say. Uh, I skipped this one. A little about the R RTI help desk that I run. We started this in 2014, and it, uh, it's a service to uh, journalists and journalist students. If you have a problem uh, or you want to ask, get information about uh, RTI matters, uh, you can contact me. It's free of charge. Uh, it's financed by uh, uh, FOYO or the Linnaeus University, uh, which is one of the sponsors here for this conference. Uh, I handle about 200 and 250 contacts every year. Uh, most of them is to just to give information or to explain how the law is, is implemented or how they should argue uh, if the, they have contact with an authority who, who doesn't want need to give out the documents. About 25% we take this to court. To, to, um, uh, I help them to, uh, to write an appeal uh, to an ad administrative court. You don't have to appear or to be in the court, you just send in your documents and then you went, you can wait two or three hours, no, two or three months <laughs> that would be a great thing, two or three hours. <laughs> uh, two or three months to, to get a verdict. And uh, in most cases, actually, uh, two out of three, we are successful. The authorities who first said no, they have to, to give out all the documents or at least some of the documents that uh, were uh, requested from the beginning. Uh, here are some common problems for Swedish journalists. Uh, as I showed you uh, before, this works mostly quite well. Uh, you, most of the time you, you get what you want, but uh, the, time, the things that don't work so well, slow handling, I said uh, immediately or uh, within one or two days. Uh, very often it takes much longer time, you have to, to contact them over and over again and say, tell them to hurry up. Uh, poor motivations or lack of motivations when they say no. And that's a problem because when we take it to court, it takes two or three hours and then the co uh, court send it back to the authority you say, and tell them you have to, to uh, present the motivation. And then it, it takes so long time and it's a waste of, of public resources then it goes back again to the to the court to 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 try it. Uh, the legislation uh, around about the email is very uh, difficult or complicated. That's uh, uh, that's a, a bad thing with having a very old legislation like we have in Sweden. It was introduced before there was any databases or email or anything like this. Uh, so actually, uh, I have to, to answer a lot of questions about that. Uh, access to documents before political decisions are made, that's also a problem uh, because they can choose whether they want to share these documents or not. And some, very often they say no, and which means that they make secret decisions. Uh, well, the, secret, the decision will be public when it's, it's made, but there is no possibility to debate or to, to get information about the alternatives and, and uh, arguments before a decision. Uh, and the police authority is uh, a big problem. I know they have uh, to keep a lot of information secret, but they, they keep too much secret and they, they don't care about very slow handling and a lot of problem. The worst authority in Sweden.
Uh, and some uh, advice. Uh, this could be difficult to give advice because uh, the conditions are so different depending on where you are in the world. And these are mostly for Swedish journalists, but hopefully for some use uh, wherever you work in the world. So the first one, be updated by a book. Uh, learn about how the law should be interpreted. Uh, if they say no, you want documents, they say no. Ask for a form formal decision and take it to the court then. Uh, use uh, legal arguments, judicial arguments. Most Swedish journalists use moral arguments. They talk about democracy and human rights and transparency. And, and I agree about all that, but the, the judge doesn't care, he wants judicial arguments. Uh, and keep up good relationships with the officials, uh, the people who work within the authority. This is uh, mostly for those who work with locals uh, and meet the same people over and over again, like myself. Uh, it will make it very much more easier. Uh, don't ask for a thousand documents, ask for 10, and if you get that, Ask for the other 990, <laughs> because if you ask for the 10,000 directly, they think, will think that, oh, a lot of job. I will find an excuse for not giving it out. Uh, and the last advice, if you have a legal advice uh, problem in Sweden, contact me and ask for help, and I might do, will do my best. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I think still many people would be calling Sweden's situation ideal, isn't it? Uh, but uh, from this point, I'd like to go to Amanda because uh, we already heard about Document Cloud and the amazing work they are doing. Amanda. Um, I didn't get you a QR code, but you can get the slides and all my notes, which I probably won't use, but um, at that link. Um, I'll leave it up for a second. So I work with the Muckrock Foundation. We're a US-based transparency organization that provides um, a number of tools to journalists and to researchers and academics and the general public. Um, we have a tool called Document Cloud that I'm gonna show you a little bit of. Um, we actually have a tool called Otranscribe that helps you facilitate the transcription process. Um, and a ton of resources. We also had, a, I saw people taking notes when Luis said that he got a grant from us. We had a very brief grants program, <laughs> so, so don't get too excited. We don't give out a lot of grants, um, but we do have a ton of resources, so I hope we can still be helpful. Um, one of our main resources is Document Cloud, which is a really powerful tool for analyzing, um, annotating, and publishing primary source documents. Um, we recently incorporated a system of add-ons, so you can actually upload an audio file to Document Cloud and we'll run it through an open source um, tool called Whisper AI that will give you a transcript, a pretty accurate transcript actually of that tool. Um, we also have some really powerful tools for turning pictures of spreadsheets into actual rows and columns. And one, this is actually an example from Luis. Um, do my little is a tool called Bad Redactions that will go through redacted documents that appear to be redacted, but actually the text is still there. Often it's black highlights that you're seeing, not actual redactions, and we'll pull the data back out. So in this case, um, Luis had a document that was, I think it was a flight, uh, flight registry, and ran it through, and they had, they had tried to redact the name of the passenger, and the name of the passenger was right there. So then he had it and could use it in his reporting. Um, so those are some of the really powerful kind of analysis tools. You can also annotate documents. Every annotation gets its own URL so that you can um, refer back to it, whether that's something you need for a fact-checking layout or to incorporate into a story to kind of like show a highlight of a story. Um, and then you can publish documents. I'm not gonna go into depth on the stories, but if you pull up the link, you can find all of these stories and a little bit of narrative about kind of like what, what we did in those. Um, and then our biggest service is our public records request service. So the US, I think, is <laughs> unique in that um, our public records FOIA law is not as old as Sweden's. It only dates to 1967, but that only covered federal agencies. And 
every state has its own public records law. Um, in some cases, either counties or cities will have a public records law that overrides the state law and is more expansive in some way. So we maintain a database of um, something like 26,000 public agencies and the appropriate public records contact for them. We also have, we, we, we process requests on your behalf, but we have a fee structure. It's very, it's like, I think it's $4 a request. It's not a lot of money. Um, if you want to keep the request private, you do have to pay us. And as a result, we have this database of millions of records that have been released, thousands and thousands of requests that have been processed and the outcome, and you can sort of like track those. And so you can use those as inspiration. Um, and the one thing I will say about the way the fee structure works is that the sort of, if you want to keep, if you want to be able to keep it uh, embargoed forever, that costs you 100 bucks a month. Um, 40 bucks a month, you can keep kind of hitting update on your 30-day embargoes, um, and then you can file for just paying per request, and there's no embargoes. So as a journalist, if you want to keep those things under wraps for a little while until your story's ready, you can do that. Um, you don't have to kind of like play your cards before you're done reporting, but then once your story is done, it becomes part of our public record and you can share it with other people and people can learn from it. Um, we have a ton of resources that are really valuable, uh, even if you're not paying for us to file the request. So like I said, we work at the city, county, state, and federal level, and sometimes there are different laws that apply at each of those levels. So we have a whole database of jurisdiction guides that covers, does this, does this law include, what is the law that applies in this municipality or region? Does it include fee waivers for journalists? Does it cover the judicial branch? Does it cover the executive branch? Does it only cover the legislative branch? Who's covered and who isn't? What kinds of exceptions? Um, so that's a really powerful resource that's public and you can look at it. Um, we also recently launched a new tool called the FOIA Log Explorer where we have, so like I said, we have this massive database of requests that we have processed. We have been systematically filing FOIA requests for all of the FOIA requests filed with federal agencies. Um, and so, and we've got those organized. So that's actually a really powerful search tool as well. So you can go in and see any request that was filed with any federal agency in the last 50 years. Um, and what, did, what are the materials that they provided? So that is also a really powerful research tool. Whether what you want to do is kind of figure out whether someone else has filed this request before or um, just get, get ideas, get ideas for language that works, see what kind of works and doesn't. And then we also then obviously have this huge database as a result of sample requests. Um, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, okay, so um, this is one, and, and I think this starts to get to like, why do international journalists outside the US need US FOIA law? Um, there were some great talks earlier this week about like pretty powerful surveillance technology that police agencies, other agencies are employing. All of those companies are looking for investors. And in their investment paperwork, they're bragging about <coughs> the agencies that they're doing business with. So anytime you've got a company that's like showing up in your region, you're curious about how they work, you're trying to figure out what's going on with them, take a look. And this one is actually Skydio. I think it's Skydio, yeah. Skydio um, is a drone company, that, so they, they do drone camera operations. Um, and they brag even just on their like About Us page, join the industry leaders who choose Skydio, and there's a bunch of agencies on there, the Cleveland police and the Boston police and a bunch of military agencies. And so Jason Kobler, who's a journalist at Motherboard, which is a vice vertical, um, just went through their, so you sort of saw that, and went through their investor materials and filed FOIA requests with every police agency that Skydio bragged about doing business with. Um, and the ones that are, there's a bunch that are still kind of in, in process, but the ones that are completed are then public and you can see those contracts. And, and the things that you can see that I think are really powerful, one, he has a really nice structure for approaching his request, which is that he always starts with kind of like how I know you have this. So he always starts with like, Skydio says on their website that they have a contract with you, here's a link to the website. Um, I would like a copy of that contract as well as any, I think he said procurement reports, um, scopes of work, so, so getting back some of the work product that has come out of that contract. 
So that can be a really powerful tool. The other thing is that um, in a lot of cases, somebody has already requested that information. So if you're interested in Skydio, you don't need to file a FOIA request. You can just come and look and see what, um, in this case, I think Jason is the only one who's filed requests for Skydio, but there's a lot of them in there. Um, but you can, you can come and see what has already been released um, and, and use that as a starting point for your own research. Um, another kind of nice sample request, um, the, the early in the, writer, in the Hollywood writers strike, somebody came in and massively trimmed back all of the trees outside of Universal Studios that were providing shade to the strikers. And there was this big question of sort of like, one, this was not a seasonally appropriate tree printing. Like there's no rain in July. You don't trim trees in the middle of summer. That needs to be happening when it's raining. And so we actually, like a ton of people filed requests for information about kind of who had done this tree trimming, had it been approved, was there any investigation of it? And one of the things that came out of, so, so actually this was Jason Kobler again, um, filed a bunch of requests with a bunch of different Los Angeles agencies looking for kind of like just any information, letters about this tree trimming. And one thing he came up with was some in, intra-city correspondence that referenced an agency he'd never heard of before called Streets LA and asked a question. So it was you know, agency to agency asking questions about like what Streets LA's role in this trimming had been. And he didn't even know they existed. We didn't know they existed. Um, and he went and looked them up and asked us to add them to their database, which is one of the things we'll do. Well, if you have an agency that isn't in our database yet, we'll add it and, and file a request with them. Um, and filed a follow-up request that hasn't come through yet, but for more information about this tree trimming. And he wouldn't have known that that agency existed, except that he did that initial request for sort of like w initial correspondence request. So kind of using that to begin the process of figuring out what you need. Um, and so we have worked as, as Muckrock, we also collaborate with newsrooms directly and we've done some large scale collaborations. There's a couple of examples. We worked with Tom Nash and the Virginia, um, a Virginia investigations, statewide investigations organization to request data policies for every school district in the state of Virginia. Um, and we also, a, a California law passed a couple of years ago opened up a kind of subcategory of police um, like personnel records, specifically around police violence to uh, California public records requests. And so there's a California reporting project as we've been collaborating with them to just systematically go in and file those requests for investigation reports on police violence activity. Um, and some really powerful reporting has come out of that work, including the discovery that one city in Northern California just has like an extraordinary number of um, people going to the hospital with police dog bites. Um, so those are the kind of collaborations that we actually work directly with newsrooms to kind of facilitate the collaboration, um, but you can also just file requests yourself. So my last little plug is that we would love to work with you. I'm happy to talk more about what kinds of ways we can collaborate with newsrooms. Um, and also my other plug is that I always encourage people to, if you're filing US FOIA requests, file them through Muckrock. Um, we do a lot of the work for you, we, we are really helpful, but also the data that we then have about how effective these laws are and how much access people have to records actually does have an impact in, in being able to shape and change law. So we can continue to fight for more expansive public records laws if we have the data about how important those public records are. Um, and there is the URL again, and I'm super happy to hand this back. Thank you, Amanda, amazing. But uh, Document Cloud is free, no? People can access Document Cloud free. So the, the website itself and the resources that are there are all free of charge. If you want us to actually process and file the FOIA request for you, we do charge for that. Um, and it's $4 per, it's either four or five, I forget, per request. Um, and if you have a membership, that takes it down to, I think, $2 per request. So it's, very, it's a very nominal fee to file the request, but everything else that we do, all of the resources on Document Cloud um, is free of charge. There are, I, I take that back, there are some, I didn't show any expensive tools, but there are a couple of tools on Document Cloud that you have to pay to use, um, but most of everything I showed here is, is free of charge. Thank you.